Hello everybody, and welcome to the 27th episode of Tech Life Skills with Tanmay. My name is Tanmay Bakshi, hope you're all doing well. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, and I gotta say that I'm really thrilled for our discussion, uh, and that's because we are actually being joined by a very special guest. He has you know, personally helped me so much along my journey of not even just learning and building tech, but, but so much more around that, right? Helping me uh, get the confidence to actually work on what I believe in when it comes to the world of tech. And of course, he's also someone that I've had a lot of fun with as well. Uh, his name is James Archieri. He's my mentor uh, and he is, what, he is the global digital advisor at Microsoft. As a matter of fact, James was actually one of the two people to actually ever reach out to me uh, and sort of offer me guidance and advice back when I started working with this machine learning technology. Now, he, alongside uh, Timothy Duncan, actually, who you may remember from the blockchain episode a couple of weeks ago, uh, were my very first mentors. And so throughout the years, I've had the opportunity to learn a lot from him. Uh, and so I'm excited to finally get to share his gold mine of experience with everybody on the show today as well. We're going to be exploring all kinds of things from, you know, what it means to uh, to mentor somebody, why that's so important, the value of networking, how as an engineer you can be more connected to your end users, and, and so much more. And of course, we're going to be answering your questions from the live stream as well. So if you're joining via YouTube or LinkedIn or Facebook, feel free to put in your questions in the live chat, and I'd love to go ahead uh, and, and take those up with James as well. And so, without any further ado, I'd now love to welcome James to the show. Hi, James. How are you? Hey, Tan May and everyone. Thanks for tuning in uh, on this exciting, awesome episode. It's an honor uh, to be here, especially since I know the other very respected guests that you've had on. So I was like, where do I fit in this? <laughs> but um, you know what? It's it's just a great it's a great opportunity to be here to talk more about you know our journey and the things that I'm passionate about and the things that are clearly you know the soft skill side mm -hmm. of growing your business and growing your impact in the world, mm -hmm. right? I know a lot of us focus in on the technical components, but behind that, you know, you have to be able to communicate out, you have to be able to connect with others to drive the impact faster, far or farther, as they say, right? Absolutely. I think there's a phrase, Tammy, that says, if you want to go fast, you go solo, but if you want to go far, you go together. Yes, so. yes, yes. Um, but yeah, thanks again for having me. Of course, of course. I mean, I'm glad to have you on the show. Finally, this is something that I've been looking forward to for some time. Glad to finally get to have you on the show. So I'm really excited. I mean, I first of all totally agree with what you just said there. You know, that's actually one of my uh, one of my favorite quotes. I believe, um, you know, someone I know it uh, uh, that, that I work with. You know, their email signature has that quote. And, you know, that was the first time I'd seen it, and uh, it, it, it means so much, right? Because you're right in the sense that technology, especially, I mean, as a technologist myself, I got to say that it is actually really, really easy to just get so narrowly focused on just advancing technology that you sometimes even forget about why you're building that technology in the first place, mm. right? Like, what are we actually doing with the tech? Whose life are we impacting? Whose life are we making better with that technology? What problem are we solving? Right. So so I feel like that is definitely something really important that we should focus on. And I'd love to sort of hear your thoughts on that as well. But maybe we should start off first in the world of mentoring. Right. And, okay. and I know that that's something that you're very passionate about, because, I mean, I know that you have you know helped me along my journey so much. Oh, you're so, a living example of it. <laughs> I guess so. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and so. You know, the question that I've had for, for the longest time, and this is what I want to ask you is, you know, back when I was working with this tech and you were like, you know, what, what, what exactly was it that inspired you to want to, you know, reach out to me and mentor me or, or give me that advice? And what exactly was that drive for you? Why'd you want to do it? Yeah, well, okay. So the ironic thing was um, about, a year, about half a year, about six months prior to meeting you on YouTube and inter inter interacting with your Watson made simple series or, <laughs> or, or no, like the Watson conversion YouTube tutorial that you posted. Yeah. Um, I had an awesome opportunity to mentor some uh, 14, 15 year olds in inner city, New York city mm -hmm. and technology while working at IBM. 
um, you know, it was a part of like giving back to the community, um, giving them an opportunity to see what a Fortune 500 environment would be like, but also giving them exposure to what real world projects are and teaming environment and allowing them to apply like UX skills or, you know, Node.js, JavaScript skills, such like that. And, and I knew that, you know, it, your age doesn't limit your, um, your potential for growth. I think your curiosity does. Mm -hmm. And what I really enjoyed about them was they were just curious and they were willing to soak up information. And you were similar to that, right? You were clearly had a, a desire to learn and a desire to share. And, but to reach out to you, and the reason why that was so important with me is because I saw that if mishandled at such a young age, right, um, with, with these younger uh, students, it will it can negatively impact their experience with big tech. It can negatively impact their experience with role models, with leaders that are supposed to be proper leaders. And my first thought was, okay, here is someone that is super smart, super bright, right? So. You know, bring the ego down for a second, right? Uh, referring to you. And I was worried that the big machine that is a hundred plus billion dollar revenue generating company, you know, um, would just see you for, oh, he could write some tutorial videos or, oh yeah, he could just write on our blog, whatever. And I'm like, that's, that's not what he needs to thrive. It's not what Tame would need to grow. So my first one was to protect. I literally reached out to ensure that you were protected from the big machine because I just knew how they worked and operated. But then secondly, I, I reached out to you because I wanted to ensure that the tools that you were playing with were the best tools that we had available to, to you and to others. Because you know, our dog food at the time was not the best tasting. Right. There were things. It, well, it's, it's the thing with any new technology, right? We were releasing stuff and you have to release stuff to the public to quickly fix it. Right. And find out where the flaws mm -hmm. at scale are. So it's just it's just the nature of the beast in that situation. And you were on the cutting edge and playing with our cutting edge technology that we had just posted. And like literally the next day, you'd be like, I just <laughs> observed this. And I really wanted to make sure that your environments were stable on, you know, Bluemix at the time, IBM Cloud. I wanted to ensure that, you know, because you were so familiar with it, you could give direct impact to the product team, development team. You know, uh, that was for me, the second reason is to ensure that again, you never got frustrated to the point where you took your, if you will, at the, if the age is, age, age analogy is appropriate, you took your toys and left and went somewhere else, right? You would go to the sandbox of Microsoft at the time, which I would prefer because I'm Microsoft now, right? Or you would have gone to Google or Amazon. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Um, and thirdly, the reason why I reached out. So again, the first one was I reached out because I wanted to just ensure that you were protected, right? The second one was I reached out because I wanted to ensure you had the right environment the right stuff to work with mm -hmm. right and then the third one is just because i have a passion for seeing people grow and, and and just mentoring because i have been mentored my whole life you know whether it was in professional or personal i believe you should always have a group of advisors you should always be reaching out for people that are one one level 10 levels higher than you the one mm -hmm. level because they they were so recent to where you've been Right. So they can provide almost like immediate, very, very relevant insight. And then a couple levels higher because one, they can expand your network much faster. Mm -hmm. And then they can also give you insight into the grander picture of like, mm -hmm. look, 10 years down the road, some of this stuff doesn't mean anything. You know, you don't need to lose sleep over stuff like this, you know, mm -hmm. whereas sometimes when you're closer to your other mentor in age, you guys are very in the same mindset, maybe about about the strategic 360 view. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, it's, it's just been something that I have always had. I've always been out there, you know, and, and I believe we can learn from anyone, any age. Mm -hmm. Right. I my one of my fondest memories of mentoring you, Tanmay, um, 
was being able to go to Mexico with you. We went to Monterey, right? Yes. And you were at this like 20,000 person conference speaking in front of all of them. But my favorite part is when, when we were in the back room um, doing the debrief with the production tr crew and they had some special VIP guests, I guess, or whatever. Um, but these were children and you were at the time were maybe like 14, 13, I think. Right. Um, and these children are probably like seven years old, eight years old, and they are in there, you know, communicating with you flawlessly and saying how you inspire them. And to me, it, it's mind boggling to me because I'm like, these, these kids are almost half your age. Right. But, yeah. but they're like, one of them was crying because you're like, you're his role model. <laughs> you're your role model. And I was like, that is just so cool. The compounding effect of helping others. Mm -hmm. um, so so that does that help a little bit more? I think that absolutely does. I mean, that gives me a really good picture as to, you know, what, what exactly is it that sort of inspired you to do this? I, I, I'm going to have to say, before I get to what you just said, going back to the very beginning of... Um, your uh, what, what you mentioned and you mentioned that when it comes to, to age age is really not a barrier when it comes to learning about anything it's your curiosity right if you're curious enough about something you're gonna want to you know it, it's just gonna be instinct to want to find out more about it and you know nowadays we have all these sorts of resources online where pretty much anyone can learn about anything um, I mean, I feel like even the Tech Life Skills Student Special kind of proves that, right? We've had so many students on from like high schoolers to and people who've just graduated university, and all of them mm -hmm. have that one common link of they're just so passionate about tech that they that they end up learning about it, right? Even if that's not something that they learn through school or through some sort of other educational institution. Um, I got to say, one of my favorite um, sort of, I guess, a funny example of that sort of age thing. Um, Back at uh, back at, uh, at at the lab here in Canada, uh, me and my friend were at this um, at this at this event. It was about you know patenting and inventing, um, and we were working with a fellow um, at IBM at the uh, at, at the lab who had never I, I, we had never met each other, uh, and we worked pretty much the whole day on on this stuff. Uh, and so my friend at the end of the day asks him, "How old do you think that he is?" So how old do you think that I am? Uh, and the fellow goes, I don't know, like 25. <laughs> what? <laughs> and I, I don't know exactly. <laughs> we couldn't stop laughing. <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah, age is, age is definitely not a barrier, I, I, I will say, right? As long as you're curious, as long as you're passionate, you will be capable of, of learning more than enough about, you know, what it is that, um, that, that you're passionate about. That's one thing. But also another thing that I, I, I sort of noticed really as a common theme across your whole sort of um, the, the, the reason that you're that you're that you want to be a mentor so much is, is because not because, but rather I've noticed that it's a lot of selfless dedication almost that goes behind these reasons. Right. Like, for example, you had no you know, selfish desire to want to protect me from, you know, the, the sort of larger, you know, industry or, or, or even individual companies that wouldn't necessarily, you know, want to uh, fully almost um, utilize that passion that I have for tech. Mm -hmm. But still, you did that because, you know, you just wanted to help and, you know, and you actually saw how that sort of compounded from there, right? So, for example, you know, I love the Mexico example, right? That's something that almost slipped from my mind, but it's amazing that you remembered that. Yeah. Um, but, <laughs> but I still remember Mexico because the, first, the minute we land, you're like, I need butter chicken. <laughs> and you're in Monterey, Mexico, and your hosts are like, I don't think there are any Indian places in Monterey, Mexico. Let's look. There's one place that sells butter chicken. And of course, it's Mexican owned and operated. But in the middle of like, you know, like an hour, an hour and a half drive away from downtown Monterey. And it was yeah. just. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. Like, yeah, I, I got that's one of the things that I remember too. But uh, you know, butter chicken is my. Sorry, you were food. saying though. I just I yeah. I had to capture that moment though. Yeah, that was, totally. No, thank you for for capturing that. That was that's... one of I remember one of your things back then. You had certain quirks, if you will, <laughs> and one of your or one of your requirements, if you will, and one of them was always we gotta have butter chicken. You know, gotta have a really good crispy chicken sandwich, Chick Fil A, or you know McDonald's or whatever it was. And then we you went on this whole you know, experiment of, 
which sandwiches are better and you had oh, a yeah. reason why. <laughs> oh yeah, I, I, I've still got those for sure. <laughs> Soft forks right. don't go away. <laughs> All right. No worries, but that, that, was a, that was a good little... Uh, but you were calling out servant leadership. Yeah. Actually, if, if you were gonna... I don't know if I would call it me being selfless, but I think it roots down to ultimately just a servant leader. And I think that um, I just been, I don't know. I, I guess it grows up, you know, cause I grew up, you know, um, younger and at times I was bullied when I was, you know, grew up cause I was a little, that awkward kid. And for me, I, when I always see younger people that are going out there, pushing themselves out there, especially, mm -hmm. you know, in an age group where you going and stepping out amongst your peers is not usually acceptable, mm -hmm. right? Uh, everyone's like, you, you shouldn't be coding, Tanmay. You should be going and playing and doing these other things. I remember how many times people were like, he needs a childhood. He's not going to yeah. be normal. Or I'm like, what, first off, what the heck is normal in the day and age? Let's just, let's just stop trying to force that societal idea on him, right? Now, if you're talking about social skills, if you're talking about the ability to communicate, you were doing that already. You and I had a similar path in one way. You know, my dad was a leader of a congregation of a church. And for me, I, for me to talk, you know, I would have to sit around and wait for my dad to close this church every day or whatever. And I would go work and have to talk to the adults. You know, I had, I'd had to learn to talk to people much higher than my station at very much times and be comfortable with that. And you were very similar. There was very little people, there was very few number of people at your age of 12 or 13 that were available for you to just talk with about the stuff that you were passionate about. So you're telling me that Tanmay needs to go make himself be uncomfortable and dumb down his insight and curiosity because of a person's understanding of what a childhood should look like. Are you kidding me? So I really, so, you know, like I, I would, I, I also reminded people, I was like, a child should be someone that is able to be protected, but also encouraged to go after what they're curious about, you know, and explore that with the, the with the ex idea that it's okay to fail. There's grace everywhere. Mm -hmm. But when you start saying the words, no, you shouldn't be talking to these older people. No, you mm -hmm. shouldn't be doing that. No, you, you should be putting your time here. Mm -hmm you then lose the curiosity. And mm -hmm. I think in all fairness, a lot of people end up losing that. I think Walt Disney ended up saying a lot about this, about how a lot of people forget how to be children when they grow up yeah. because they're so used to being told no. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, your creative part of your brain starts to shift and shrink. Mm -hmm. And then your analytical brain, it beca you become so analytical, then you lose your empathy, which mm -hmm. we'll talk about later. You know, you'll, you'll lose the parts of you that ask why and or why not, right? And, and then you just become kind of like a drone and accept that this is my, my fate, my mm -hmm. life. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I, I was just, I, I probably went on a long monologue for that. But yeah, it's something it's I'm very passionate about because, man, it would boil my 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 blood when people would say to me, "Tan may be, you know, doing this and whatnot." I'm like, what you don't see behind the scenes is a family that loves him, supports him. I, your mom, you know, selfless too, mm -hmm, right? Definitely. Um, your dad, selfless. Mm -hmm. You know, your dad wanted to support you so much that you know he quit his full time job. I mm -hmm. remember that. You know, like. That was scary for everyone, but you know, your family was so invested in your happiness mm -hmm. and, and, and your curiosity that it, that's, that's huge. That's mm -hmm. huge. And so mm -hmm. again, for me, and I'd encourage, you know, parents that, or future parents one day is like, try not to project your understanding of what is normal on your child, mm -hmm. right? Allow them the freedom in the room to grow with support. Right. And that's why then, you know, our mentoring became more familial. I think mm -hmm. your, your parents even said, like, James is not out to to reap benefits financially from Tan May. James genuinely cares about him as a little brother. And I've always viewed you as a little brother. I think that's one of the coolest things about our mentoring track is it went to family mm -hmm. and that aspect. I totally so, agree. 
That's all. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, totally. That 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 makes so much sense. And and no, that wasn't just you know a long monologue. That uh, that that was really valuable because, as a matter of fact, I was about to ask. You know what? What <laughs> makes what makes you know a good mentor in, in your view? And I feel like that actually <laughs> that that pretty much uh, hits it hits the nail on the head, right? It's 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 all about that 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 I mean that genuine care that you had that you know you wanted to sort of help me and 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 that sort of not even just sort of ends at me but then extends out from there right and i feel like that really makes an impact in the world in general right overall um and and you mentioned empathy right and actually one of the sort of the from the reason that you mentioned empathy around you know people sort of almost forgetting what it's like to be a child when they grow up right yeah yeah exactly as a matter of fact we had an entire episode on that with john cone <laughs> oh i love john cone yeah for those who are listening what episode is that do you know off the top of your head uh, i will go ahead and actually get the link and put that in the live stream well, chat. Uh, uh, but guys john and gals john cone was i don't know if he's still at ibm or not or retired yes. he's, he's retired no he's at ibm okay so he's an IBM fellow, and he, you know, he was on Discovery Channel, um, but his whole um, mission statement for the world is called like something about never stop playing, the art mm -hmm. of play, you know, and the idea behind that, that in work, you should be able to find enjoyment and fun and have pl and, and playful experiences around that. And, and I think also, too, sometimes we forget that or we try to make sure that our whole job is fulfilling that. And sometimes it, it doesn't, it's not the direct one, but it allows you to have conduits that provide you the fun, right? Um, so yeah, John Cohn's really, really, really awesome. He's the type of guy that would wear like these glasses that would have mm -hmm. LED writings of going across them as he's presenting on stage. I also remember when you keynoted, yeah. um, at IBM Interconnect and you keynoted, I think either with him at one point or prior or after him. And he had to introduce you and, and you got the rating that, um, this was when you were like 13, by the way, and you presented and everyone was like voted on the best keynote speakers. And John Cohn was number one. And then you were number two or something like that. I blew everyone else out of the water. And one of my favorite, one of my favorite components was you were giving a presentation in a demo. And the product wasn't working. Yeah. <laughs> you had said flawlessly in your presentation, oh, it's okay, it's in beta. And without missing a beat, you just kept going and everyone is in, in raucous laughing and whatnot. And I think again, you know, Tim Mates, because one it'd be one thing if you know I found this 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 12 year old and I mentored him and just threw him on stage, but you were ready. You were groomed, you, you, because you yourself were spending your time and your energy on being better. And so, all what I did come along was I provided you a bigger platform, right? And then Sandy Carter saw mm -hmm. what I saw. And you were, we were fortunate for an executive at the time to see that, right? And then, so she helped like rocket ship you up into, you know, the limelight there on the keynote stage. Um, you know what I mean? And so yeah. um, it was just really, really cool. So I think, again, if you're the question is, you know, when it makes a great mentor, I, you know, I, this sounds very biased because I, including myself, I think I'm a good mentor. I, I think, though, again, man, it, it first comes to being a really, I'm talking a lot, by the way, but a really good listener. So the irony, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, and I don't mean like a passive listener where, you're, 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 you're telling me and I'm already thinking of the solutions. No, I mean an active listener where genuinely, when you tell me what are your goals, your dreams, your aspirations, what are your concerns, your fears? I, I'm listening, I'm writing that down. I am absorbing it. I spend some time to internalize it. And then I come up, uh, a, a, another example was um, with this uh, mentoring program back in New York City at IBM, p -Tech. Uh, this young kid and his name, uh, I think Devante, if I still remember it right. Devante, I uh, had been assigned, well, actually, fun fact, uh, unfortunately for him, his originally assigned mentor never showed. And I happened to be walking the halls and I see an ice cream party. Again, this is classic James, right? You know, <laughs> me being 
curious, curious of what's going on. Why, where was my invite to ice cream? You know, <laughs> so I go over, I'm like, what is this? And they're like, oh, it's this mentoring program we've got. And I was like, well, does anyone need a mentor? Cause you know, I'm here. And they said, actually this one children's mentor never showed. And that honestly could have been the saddest thing for this kid. Cause all his other friends from the same school or his, they're with their mentors talking and this kid's just sitting there. I'm like, I was so curious yeah. with this adult that let this child down. I'm like, how dare you? So mm -hmm. I went right up to him and I said, Hey, how you doing? I'm James Archery. I know nothing about really coding, <laughs> but, um, you're a developer, huh? And he's like, yeah. And I was like, so what do you want to do? We have three months together over the summer internship. And he's like, well, I'd really like to build a computer game. And I'm like, oh my God, that's going to be hard and long. And you may get bored with that. So how about this though? I hear you want to build a game. What about a mobile app game, like a mobile game? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, I know, I've known enough about like software development to know that the agile sprint methodology and the ability to show like the working code faster and mm -hmm. seeing it live makes a world of an impact versus building out a computer simulation that takes forever to add on all the elements potentially. And then for you to start to be enjoying it. Mm -hmm. um, and he's like, Oh, that could be fun. Let's do a mobile game. Right. Cause you know, who doesn't have a mobile phone at this time back then. Mm -hmm. Right. And I'm like, cool. I know nothing about building a mobile app. <laughs> But, but here's the thing, it's okay, because I, as his mentor, it was my job to find the right resources for him to be able to have a platform to build it. So I go on Google. This is another thing. Not only do you listen and, 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 and understand what he wants, a mentor then figures out how to help them get there, mm -hmm. right? Um, uh, now, some people will say, well, you have these things called champions and sponsors, and we can go into the difference of those later. But I really think that a proper mentor can sometimes transfer all of those capabilities. Mm -hmm. I know people like to bucket themselves. Well, I'm not going to mentor you. I'm like, well, honestly, though, honestly, you know, I think I'm, to be a sponsor, you have to know a lot about your person. Mm -hmm. To be a champion, you have to know a lot about a person. And so it starts with the mentor component, mm -hmm. right? And the mentor mm -hmm. is kind of like, building that friendship at the very early stages, you're finding out the things that you you enjoy with each other and how you can help them out. And so again, I found out in New York City that there is a, a maker space that mm -hmm. is just for mobile game developers and computer games. And literally it's free. And every Thursday they will test their games and they're looking for participants to test their games. Interesting. Right? And these are people that are building on Unity and Unreal Engine and all the actual things that, mm -hmm. you know, like game developers do. Yeah. And so I took him and I, you know, and then it turns out everyone else was interested on his, in his group. So I, I ended up chaperoning like seven 15 year olds, <laughs> 16 year olds. And here I am only being like 22 years, 23, 24. And I'm like, I have no idea what I'm doing, but now I also need to feed these kids as part of this mentorship program. I'm like, how do I not break the bank in New York city by feeding people, including myself? Um, but it was such a good moment for them and for myself because it, like you, they were curious, they wanted to grow themselves and they just needed people to, offer them and i think it, it stems back to me man like i we all are looking for that one shot that one person that is willing to stick a stake in the ground and say i've got your back i will be there for you and i mm -hmm. think you know and i've had that fortunately i had that in um my biggest champion that catapulted my whole career and growth was a gentleman um named rob sauerwald um and the woman before that she was my she was my first boss and she was awesome well she wasn't my first boss but she was my like my second boss or third boss at my ibm and but she said to me she's like james you may not be the most experienced person on my team but i see something in you and i see an aptitude to grow an aptitude and willingness to learn and a curiosity like a sponge man and she's like i can work with that I can mold that. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and so she took me on her team, even though like a, her fellow peer said previous to her, I'm not going to hire James cause he doesn't have the 20 years experience that I, I don't have. Right. And that's how I became a, a cloud advisor, mm -hmm. man, is because 
he took a chance on me. And then the VP said, James, you are the youngest person on our team by 15 years. The only way to fix that is by having you insanely mentored by <laughs> three or four different people and shadow you and give you instant feedback. And so, you know, and they, and they probably had no idea what they would have done for you because of helping me and thousands and thousands and thousands of other people. So again, it really starts with like just investing mm -hmm. and selflessly investing because you don't go in there saying, I'm going to invest in them to help out 10,000 people. Yeah, yeah, totally. It's, it's one of those side effects that ends up helping out the world, even though you don't necessarily have that specific goal, right? It's not like, you know, you mentored me for the explicit objective of being able to, you know, help out X number of people in the future. But that's what ended up happening, right? You make the world a better place by, by, by doing so, which is, again, mm -hmm. you know, what's, what's, what's so exciting empathy people we need more of it we definitely do and you know now i feel like especially within the world of technology right like if we look at why we build tech it's to solve problems right it's it's to allow people to live better lives even problems that sometimes we don't realize we have right things that mm. you know we, we don't necessarily realize this is a problem by using technology, we can, in a way, make our lives so much easier that we that we almost look back in the past and are like, how did we ever live without that, right? There are just yeah. so many things like that. And <clears throat> that's why Timmy. I feel, yes. Timmy, did you know that there was a thing called MapQuest and people would print out directions on a piece of paper uh, that was not <laughs> dynamic and that's how they got around? Can you believe that? That's sad to think about. <laughs> there, there was no Google app maps. There was no Apple map. Is that crazy? That that is. I'd ask your parents about that. I'd be like, hey mom, dad, did you guys ever heard of this like archaic technology called <laughs> Map Quest? <laughs> no, I actually think I remember from like back when I was, I don't know, maybe even seven or something, um, or or maybe eight. Uh, you know, I, I'd be printing out literal um, like 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 screenshots of the Google yeah. Maps page. Or like make it right here yeah, or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but you don't know what the traffic is if there's construction yeah. going on. Exactly. Or even before that, I remember my dad having to buy these massive maps, <laughs> right? And he's like planning out the route. He's like, well, we're gonna go up. I-95 from, <laughs> from Virginia to, you know, New York City. This is the route we're going to go. And I'm just like, oh, wow. Wow. Uh, that is that is so weird to think about nowadays that we just literally, I mean, nowadays we can get in a car and the car can drive itself. <laughs> so yeah, and you we, could stop and you could be in the middle of nowhere and then ask the car, hey, where's the closest... Uh, restaurant or yes. where's the closest McDonald's or the closest bathroom and you because that type of information was not available on those maps oh, yeah. right but it's like, you know what boom done yeah. right here yeah exactly all pretty much all the information could be solving problems for people tell me about this yes what? actually so so I mean what I was about to say is that you know going back to our point about empathy if Talking. we talk totally um, if we talk, go back to that point about empathy you know I, I feel like it's really important to uh, incorporate empathy in the process of building technology simply because of the fact that building tech is about solving problems and unless you can empathize with the user and the problems that they face it's really difficult to build good technology solutions well, so yeah I would say at the end of the day the, the thing that I've always remembered is technology is just an enabler mm -hmm. It enables humans to achieve more. I think you've even quoted that before. Totally. So maybe I'm quoting you. Uh, <laughs> or maybe I'm quoting the Microsoft's mission statement to achieve more empowered people everywhere, which is actually what it is. But it, it, it's true, though. It is about enabling you, myself, do more, be more, reach farther than we were able to reach prior mm -hmm. to it becoming in our lives. Not to cause more friction at all. You know, unfortunately, though, um, there are some negative side effects. Like, you, I don't know if anyone's seen the Facebook dilemma, or the social dilemma that Facebook came out or uh, Netflix came out with on Facebook about how maybe we shouldn't have all this information about each other. Maybe we shouldn't have certain things that cause relationships to strain because they see this world and they're like, oh, I want that. And... You know what I mean? It, it, it's, it's unfortunate. But going back to your point, I agree. Technology is all about enabling. It's about empowering others. Mm -hmm. So where do we go with that thought, though? Where are you going with that thought? 
I, I guess where I'm going is that, I mean, and <laughs> I got to say, this is something that, you know, even, even I've um, uh, almost been a victim, not a victim of, but something that I've succumbed to as well from time to time, is that, especially as engineers, right, it's really, really easy to sort of almost forget about the user and be like, okay, this technology is really interesting, we're going to develop this out and we're going to see where we can apply it and sort of go from the technology back to the user, which doesn't really work in a lot of cases, right? Like I, I've actually personally seen, you know, uh, at, at, at different companies, like I'll actually uh, take a look at some of their um, interviews that they'll have with uh, clients about different software that they've built and the clients will come back to them and be like, the software wasn't built for us, right? It's, it's not built for wow. the kind of people you're interviewing. <laughs> we know no. nothing about data science, and this is asking us all these sorts of questions, and it's having us interact with this kind of interface that we don't know how to interact with. Um, and so I, I guess, and, and of course, there are actually quite a few different questions coming in from the live stream, so we'll get to that in a moment as well. Ooh. But I wanted to ask you, from your perspective, how exactly can a technologist or an engineer actually stay that well connected or, or empathize with the user. And I feel like it doesn't even just end at the technologist, right? We can't just silo it to them. As an organization, really, how do you think that process should flow so that, in general, the org is more empathetic towards the people actually using their software or their hardware, whatever it is that they're building? Great question. So um, how can an organization ensure that the people that are using it or doing it feel like they're it's meant for them, I think, or build out a culture, I think is what you're calling out. Mm -hmm. um, well, I think ultimately at the end of the day, you have to lead by example. You have to have leaders that are showing the development teams engaging with the customers. So a, a perfect example um, for me, I, I worked, I've worked at two very, very big Fortune 500 companies, mm -hmm. and I have observed how they both make products and they do it very differently. Um, and one of them, when I was first there, when we were, man, it was early days and we weren't necessarily engaging the customers in the development life cycle process. Mm -hmm. And so like, to your point, when we would release the products, some of them anyways, no consumption at all. It just, it, and it would be great. We would do the greatest marketing campaigns. We would do the greatest, and you would try to draw them in, but then the people would use them and like, this is not for me. This is. Also, this is not for enterprise. This is yes. not what I want. And then I, I went to this other company and I'm, I observed them and I'm like, holy crap, what they do is before I, idea is even necessarily funded, they would go to potential customers and they would on napkins write out, hey, these are the features we wanna add. Can you rank them from you know 10 to zero stars? If it 10, what would 10 stars look like for you? And they would say, had all these features. They said, sorry, I'm drinking <laughs> sparkling water. So, Hawking <laughs> Rain, please sponsor me. Uh, Pacific Northwest. <laughs> or people, feel free to send me Talking Rain, Peach Nectarine. It's my favorite. <laughs> um, but you would, you, would, you would have the customer rank with you through the process. And the customer would say, well, you know what? I don't need all 10 stars. I'm actually okay with seven stars worth of features. That does the meat for me. That does, that's all I really need. And I'll pay for that. And what you've just done there is you have a potential willing customer that has given you insight on what they need. And then you ask them, hey, we're gonna build this out. Would you like to be on the front lines with us, proving it out and making sure that it's right just for you, you know, right for you. The best part is you don't just stop there. You do it with like 10 other customers. Mm -hmm. You get these lined up and now you go back to the senior leadership and say, we have 10 customers that are at this scale, this size, that are interested in leveraging this. And we know that if we build these features, not these extra ones, but just these features, it will be sold, it'll be purchased, it'll be adopted and utilized, right? Mm -hmm. Right then and there, you invest. You invest mm -hmm. and you fund that team. You mm -hmm. scale up that team. You support the team, right? And that then builds out a culture of a proper methodology. It always forces you to be talking to the customer. And what there's a there's a phrase in the world that we hear about called it's called human centered design. Yes, that is that is literally an example there where you are having the user, the human at the core of the design process, right? Um, you're validating it constantly in the agile process. So I think as part of building a culture out, you have to set up examples at the leadership mm -hmm. because at the end of the day, if the top 
doesn't present down to everyone the core values, then people are left wondering, what are we about? Right. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you can have a really strong bottom up approach and, and a real good company does do that. They allow the top to lead though. They set the core, but they bring in ideas from the bottom up as well. Mm -hmm. Like again, going back to regardless of your age, regarding of your rank or your level in a company, everyone can have insights. You know, uh, but you, you allow the meshing, the mentoring and the building together. So then the culture is good. Mm -hmm. But um, so I think that's definitely one of the ways you can build an organization around um, always having your mind on the customer. I think one of the craziest, you know, Jeff Bezos is very adamant about this. He's like, it's always about the customer. It is always about the customer. And you even so then let's take your question, Jim, though. I've talked about the org. Let's talk about the individual. How does the individual as the practitioner, right? As the developer, as the UX designer, as the seller, right? Um, become better in tune. Well, you're a user. Everyone is a user. We all have the opportunity to try an experiment on ourselves. And you, and like you said, you know, okay, well, this software maybe that you're talking about wasn't designed to be just for data scientists. It was supposed to be a higher level up where you had the power of, you know, Python and R pre-baked in at like a lower level, mm -hmm. but then at the higher user interface, you don't need to know what type of code is being used here. Yeah. You just, it's, it's more of the business conversation components, right? Mm -hmm. Well, cool. Then give it to someone that maybe isn't a data scientist and, and or try to abstract from yourself I'm not a data scientist in this situation. I know that my persona, again, this is a good example. You always build personas. You, the persona of this potential customer, who really is it? And then validate that though. Mm -hmm. A lot of times to your point though, there are some problems where you, can, you run into trouble too of building a persona without the actual person in the room ever engaged. So you have an idea of what you think the person is but you never validate it. So you're go you then become in the vacuum, this hypothetical and based on your individual bias mm -hmm. of what you think that persona is. Um, so there's a whole methodology there and opportunity um, for you to self reflect in the development process, but even experiment. Mm -hmm. Does that help a little bit more? Absolutely. Right. I feel like maybe my favorite point of what you mentioned is that this isn't just something that that ends at the individual it's a culture thing right it's you can't just say you know every engineer now you know we're, we're gonna have to start thinking more about our users it's, it doesn't just end at saying that right you've actually got to take steps as a culture with an organization or a team to actually work towards making that happen um you know you know best i feel like the example that you gave um that that, re that really resonates with me is not actually having the person in the room and not knowing exactly who it is that you're building technology or solving a problem for that's a that's an immediate downfall um there's actually a project it happens so often yes I, I, my favorite example which unfortunately i can't give that example right now we're gonna have to wait a little bit um but uh james i think i've told you a little bit about this before but <clears throat> you know there's this this project i'm under friend da i haven't heard anything <laughs> i won't say anything <laughs> but but there is a project that i'm working on um that you know on its own from a technical perspective uh, looks kind of weird almost, but it's able to outperform really similar techniques actually from like OpenAI and Google. And the reason for that is because it was built from, you know, the, the reason that I built it from scratch was to use it to be able to augment people, right? Whereas mm. these other solutions that other companies are coming out with are trying to say, oh, how can we replace individuals? How can we replace um, the, the, the people that we're targeting? And sure. even in the cases where they try and sort of uh, almost, I would say, extrapolate that technology from replacing to augmenting and say, hey, can you use this to help you in your job? It doesn't work because you had built it with a completely different goal in mind. Now you're trying to say, hey, can we rip it out of the structure we've already built it in and try and you know, paste it on top of uh, this person's job and see if it can help them? It doesn't work that way, right? Mm. So when you build technology with a very specific end goal in mind, with a very specific objective in mind, that is what is really impactful, in my opinion. And so th that's definitely important. And again, at the end of the day, technology is about value, right? It's about the value that it adds to people's lives. And 
it's also about trade-offs, right? Like you mentioned, James, just because you could add a 10-star feature to a product doesn't mean everybody needs it, meaning you might actually be better off not implementing it if you could do your 7-star features as good as you possibly can get them to be, right? And time to market. Yeah, right? absolutely. Less resources required. I mean, the thing is, to your point, everyone thinks they need something super, super, super perfect <laughs> and all the bells and the whistles. Well, sometimes people don't, they don't need all that. Like you look at the Keurig, it, it took the idea of having instant coffee readily available to you. You didn't need like these other ones with all these espresso features and whatnot. People just yeah. wanted a single <laughs> serve cup of coffee with as little mess and cleanup as possible, yeah. right? With lack of the filters, right? Because no one, everyone hated putting the filters in and putting the cups of coffee and grains on that. And it just simplified it, right? It didn't, but then there are those people that want the more elegant experience and you buy these multi-thousand dollars expression machines. That's fine. There's a market for that, yes. right? But uh, exactly, exactly to your point. Right. If there, if there wasn't a market, they wouldn't be selling them, right? But got to people... gotta ask the user, totally. you know, and, and, and research and, and figure it out. And I think um, another thing too, Tammy, when like you asked me, I just was able to flex there, the user journey. A lot of people uh, forget to write that out. And uh, you know, it's, just, it's super simple. You take a piece of paper, you draw a little squiggly line, you say, well, here's where they start engaging with us. What is that experience gonna be like? What are all the interactions that we have with them? How do we, com- you know, um, support them, convert them, enable them. Um, and then what is that, that handoff experience with us, right? Mm-hmm. And you do that and you keep doing that and you keep doing that on every different avenue that they get there and it really understands the ways to ensure that they get that white glove and treatment. I think that with the day and age that we're in now, um, especially what I've seen with customers, they expect everything to be unique for them. But unfortunately, that is an at scale problem. How do you provide for 30,000, a million customers, individual experiences that are white? You know, you can't custom design each time, yeah. but you have to make sure that they get a certain percentage, like 80% feels like it's, it's, tailored, it, it's catered or tailored to them. Mm-hmm. And that is part of the user journey. And what I mean by that is a simple thing, like you log into your grocery store or you go to the, a regular grocery store.com's website and you go to, you're looking at products and you go to enter the thing. It should know right away where you are located. That is a little bit more tailored, right? Mm-hmm. It knows a little bit more about you. And then a little step further, it should also know that you wanted this item, but this item's not near you. Oh, by the way, here's the next closest item near you. We could add this to your basket mm-hmm. and have it, and then ship it to you if you'd like. Mm-hmm. Wow, that's even more catered and tailored to my experience. I really like this. This builds more brand loyalty. Because the lo- and, and, But the thing is, though, it's a very low barrier entry. I'm talking about grocers and just this example. Mm-hmm. But that's what I mean by many to, you know, the one to the many site situation where everyone has, has their own, there's thousands of people that log into your website or, or don't even log in, but at least when they get there, it feels ca- tailored and catered to them. Mm-hmm. Like you at least are trying to understand them. Yeah. And I feel like that's also where new technology like AI and machine learning can help us out so much. 100%. Right? Yeah. It, it, it really helps that experience feel better and greater. You know, like we were talking about the, the Google Maps component, mm-hmm. right? And mm-hmm. I think um, a, an example that I really, really like sometimes with technology, whereas I, I set something up in my calendar or whatever. And because I'm all, sometimes when I set something in my calendar, I forget it. But then Google will remind me or Siri will remind me or Apple Maps will say, hey, by the way, I know you've got this on your calendar. This thing is this far away. Here's the traffic today you may want to leave a little early today. I'm like, maybe I was like so focused on a, another project or task. Like, that's awesome. You're making my life better, easier. So I become more punctual, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. That's huge. That, that is, is huge. Absolutely. And, and there's a lot of AI just behind the scenes on that. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, everything <laughs> from traffic prediction to, you know, route, uh, route. You know, my, maybe my driving fast speed. And <laughs> I mean, I mean, you know. <laughs> But uh, 
but exactly i think yeah. it's really cool and and and, and it, what that literally example shows is about empowering again mm -hmm. it is an empowerment experience mm -hmm. i don't feel like i'm being told what to do i feel like it is helping me with my brand it is helping me with the um responsibilities in my life that i want to take responsibility for and be mm -hmm. there and show up on time and frequent. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I know we have probably limited <laughs> time. And you, you, there's still other topics to talk about. No Man, worries. We, uh, I hope this is okay. Oh no, this is perfect. We, we're 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 pretty flexible as a what matter. Is, of what fact. does your audience say? Does anyone have a question so far? Yes, actually, I was about to ask. Uh, as a matter of fact, Akash just reminded me. What are we? What about the live chat questions? But yes, we are getting to those now. All right, all right, we're getting. Let's go, Akash. Come on. <laughs> All right, let's start let's actually. Let's take one or two lives. Let's go, let's go. <laughs> All right, let, let's start out with a question uh, from Akash, actually. Uh, and so he's talking, you know, on the point of mentoring, what are your views on self-education and being self-taught? And also, how should students go about learning different concepts by themselves? Um, and does it give them, and, and also I would assume, why is it important to give them more freedom in the way that they learn? Okay. First off, there was a lot of freaking questions in there, Akash. So uh, shame on you. I'm kidding. All right, so Tammy, you'll have to keep me honest to make sure I answer them, okay? Because I can't sure. see them in front of me. Sure, got it. Well, I will go with the last question he asked about the freedom. So Akash, you probably noticed I got all this energy and you're like, man, this guy cannot stand still. I know, <laughs> right? Okay, so I have ADHD. Right, it is in theory considered a learning disability. And so here's a very interesting thing that I learned that my parents share with me and statistics will prove is that when you are in your transformative years, you're still in it, Tanmay, the transformative years are from zero to 18, right? How you experience creativity and the freedom to create just projects you for the rest of your life and how you handle problems, okay? And so, what I'm getting at is in sometimes the public school system, um, not all of them, but in some most of them frequently, you you again, you're taught to teach at scale. You are not taught to teach the individual. You are taught to teach 30 students at a time. You're taught to teach 100 students at a time and you do standardized tests. And don't get me wrong, you, you have to standardize things when you are doing at scale. But unfortunately, there are very individuals in that process that have very unique learning styles and behaviors. And so my mom, until I was, we were fortunate enough, but you know, we didn't live off much. But the point is my mom until eighth grade homeschooled me, right? I was homeschooled Interesting. like yourself. I was homeschooled until eighth grade. So I so I, my, I could have a foundation of how to learn, of how, of how to, you know, um, read and write and speak and do all these other things, right? And also, you know, I, I I had my first job when I was 12 I, I, by my own accord, right? I went and worked at an auto shop and I think that's very valuable. Granted, people say that's child labor. Okay, whatever, you know, back in the day, you know, the 1600s, 1700s, 1800s, even 1900s, people were working and getting apprenticeships. They were learning things like responsibility, showing up on time, you know, uh, the value of integrity, hard work. I'm not saying they work full-time jobs at all. You know, I work like an hour a day for five days a week or something like that, you know, or two hours. It at least had, gave me something else to understand. And um, so to your point, Akash, uh, I believe it's super important for the figures in your life, your parents, your brothers and your sisters, um, to, and your friends to help support your curiosity. Um, but let's let's say you don't unfortunately have that. Well, then, okay, there is this awesome thing called the internet, and there's a huge community out here. I'm assuming if you're watching this, you have access to the internet. Unfortunately, there are a lot of people that don't, so I, I can't talk to that right now. I am talking to the people that have access to the internet. There are plenty of mentors out there. You have to just go and ask. You know, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid of the value you bring to the table. You, as a human being, have value. Trust me, end of story, right then and there. That should be your bar at the bare minimum, okay? Um, going one step further, yes, you have to self-taught, self-care, because no one's gonna teach you this stuff. No one's gonna necessarily gonna 
shove it down you. I think the worst thing you can do is ask for a mentor and they give you advice or they give you things to do and you don't do it. Then you stop losing that person as an ally and a mentor. It, it's, it happens, right? Like it's just because it's like a friendship, you know, and if you're not going to hold your end of the bargain, then why are they going to keep trying to, you know, invest time and energy? I have had, I have had people that have asked me to be their mentor and I have tried to mentor them and they weren't following up on their side of it. And so I had to cut them out of my, of that sphere because mm -hmm. my time and energy is important too. And I, I should allocate it to people that want to learn and grow. And so like, you know, I give time to you, Tim, and I give time to other people because you want it, you take advantage of it versus mm -hmm. the people that could care less. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so I think his first question, or his last question was, what is your thought process on, you know, how do people get so taught and educated? Was that, was that his last question? That, that did answer, uh, I mean, I would say uh, uh, the umbrella of questions that he was answering. Um, but actually, he asked another question, which was okay. sort of an extension to this one, which is the one that I want to get to now. Uh, and he's saying, according to you, for a student in technology, what should their mindset, approach, qualities, and skills be like? So it's a uh, pretty, again, oh. wide-ranging question. But... <laughs> I would say um, <laughs> objects in mirror differ. <laughs> uh, <laughs> do you know what I'm talking about? Like, um, like on cars, sometimes yeah. old cars, like a reflection, and you know, and yeah. whatnot. Honestly, there's no right answer to becoming smarter. I mean, the first step is just you got to be curious, and then you got to have action behind that. You know, inactivity is the worst thing you can do. Right. You, you have to be active. And the reason why and active, curious, reflective, because activity for the sake of activity doesn't necessarily make you move forward. You could just be spinning your gears. You, you have to reflect. You have to say, OK, why am I hitting friction points? What are the friction points that I'm hitting? Um, what is holding me back here? So it, I think it is a cycle of curiosity and reflection with activity. Right. I know. Mm -hmm. I remember IBM used to, in the design thinking process had this like infinity loop yeah. and it was about observe, reflect, action. Right. And it was just a, and it, you, but you need to live with that because honestly, those are the skills that we need to teach children to be curious. We need to teach children that you got to go out and get it. I'm not saying you dog eat dog, throw people under the bus. No, don't ever do that. Um, you know, you have to help other people out. And that's not me necessarily promoting like socialism or anything like that. I'm just talking about the greater good, like help others out, um, you know, because once you get to the top, there's a lot of people that helped you get there. There is very rarely has anyone ever done anything of greatness solely on their own accord. Yeah. Right. There was somewhere or somewhere that opened a door for them or gave them a book or gave them insight or whatever. So skills, Curiosity, you got to encourage it, teach it, right? Skills, and, and, and again, how you build that curiosity is you, you allow them to make mistakes mm -hmm. and you help them learn from it, but you don't scold necessarily. You, you incentivize them to be more curious. You give them a room of grace. You allow them to be reflective. Taking time to reflect is a thing that people forget to do. Mm -hmm. And a simple thing about that, Tan May, is um, at the end of the day, a gratitude journal. Mm -hmm. Just something simple like that. And it builds out a muscle in you about pausing, mm -hmm. reflecting. Um, because again, sometimes people just work really, really hard and will just put their head down and just be like, I'm going to make this work. And you don't want to do that because you get burned out mm -hmm. and then your relationships get strained. You know, mm -hmm. you've got to work smart. And reflection is a way for you to figure out how to work smarter. And uh, activity, you just got to be hungry. And but the yeah. thing is, though, the more you reflect, the less friction possibly you're going to have to encounter. Right. So when you do apply your energy, it isn't feel like it's going nowhere. Right. Mm -hmm. So does that help a little bit more? Because it's not I'm not going to say that it, this is the right way to become a, a technologist. I, I would say, though, that at, at a core, though, you need some soft skills in yourself. Mm -hmm which will maybe make your journey less hard or maybe easier, but you know, it, it's not, 
there is no way like masters or something like this or that or because everyone learns differently i've learned that much mm -hmm. I, is that I, fair i i mean personally for me i i feel like it did answer the question but of course akash any follow-up questions feel free to put those in the live stream chat and you know i i gotta say that i totally agree with you right everybody fundamentally learns very differently. I've met people that, you know, will will pretty much solely learn from, you know, very explicit documentation for code given to them. I've met oh. some people uh, that will never look at documentation in their lives. And that's just a small example, right? That's just, yeah. you know. Well, you learn to... differently. Yes, absolutely, right? I'm yeah. one of those folks that, that really likes to learn from example, right? Well, really likes to. I'm a know, visual learner. Oh. I'm a visual storyteller, Yes. right? I, I, um, I hate reading pages upon pages of information. Some people love to read. I will prefer if you can tell me what you're trying to tell me by showing it. Oh, I will instantly assimilate that information. Very right? nice. Right. That, that's uh, exactly what we're talking about. Right. Everybody learns differently. Yeah. Right. And Tammy, and you and I are both the proponents of homeschooling. Way to go. Yeah, absolutely. Child's uh, homeschooling. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's, it's all about that flexibility, right? It's all yeah. about enabling you to learn how it is that you want to learn, all right? And I feel like that goes, uh, you know, all sorts of ways from, from you know, pretty much any field. It's, it's, it's all about being able to, um, to, of course, learn in that sort of targeted way. And in fact, actually, Naman Sharma in the, um, in the live stream chat has a comment about what we were talking about, about being uh -oh. self-taught. <laughs> he said that being self-taught can sometimes hold you back from exposure. But what I'm thinking is, I mean, I mean, I, you know, I've, I've learned a lot of programming on my own and James has learned a lot. Of, I mean, James was homeschooled, right? And I don't think we were ever really devoid of exposure. I mean, what do you think, James? Yeah, well, I agree. I think that, and I'm not saying you put yourself in a bubble at all. Yeah, that was never what we're saying. I think when we mean by self-taught, it's the curiosity again. And you know what? We all, you know, we talk about getting exposure to people. There, there's practical, you know, exposure, you're right. But then there's also the theoretical to learn. That's why that we have these awesome things called books too, and and YouTube videos where you can learn lessons with sometimes not having to get burned, right? You can learn how to cook with that, and or also learn that fire it causes damage to people without you having to go start a fire and putting your hand on it, right? So, I believe there's a lot of ways to get exposure, and you're so we're not talking about bubbling ever. Mm -hmm. we're talking about you must be curious and curiosity allows you to go out and go practical, but then also curiosity allows you to learn from others that have been there. It allows you to stand on the shoulders of giants, mm -hmm. right? And self-taught is just a concept about, what we're talking about is self-starting. I think that's the key there is self-starting. You can't expect people sometimes just come out there and give you the golden ticket like in Willy Wonka, right? <laughs> you have to be willing to explore and ask, but, and, and, and here's the thing, man, there's a great quote from Wayne Gretzky. You miss all, you know, hundred percent of the shots you don't take. Mm -hmm. The answer is always no, if you don't ask, mm -hmm. you know, I, I've been a big, <laughs> I have been a bigger believer in that phrase right there, man. I always ask, I don't care how many times you get shot down. You just need one. Yeah. You want, and even in sales, they talk about how conversion rates are like 2%. That means you have to make a lot of shots, <laughs> but 2%, yeah can be a lot eventually added up yeah so, so to your friend's comment there or whoever commented um you know we i i do agree that if you believe you can only be successful on your own you're right but we are not talking about that we are talking about how you need to be self-starter that how you need to be curious and um that you are learning from others so mm -hmm. It's all about that learning from others, right? I mean, that's what sets us apart as humans. It's, it's that we don't need to learn everything on our own, right? We can learn from other people's Man, and I'll tell you mistakes. what, man, pride is the biggest, you know, evil in this situation. Pride mm -hmm. is the reason why a lot of people don't reach out sometimes because they think they, they can do it on their own. Mm -hmm. And then they take longer than they need to. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, and, or people think that or for whatever reason, maybe they're dealing with an internal battle about having to prove something on their own. But you don't have to. <laughs> you know, why Why do you even want to put that pressure on yourself? Don't worry about that. There are lots of things you can do 
well, very well, with the help of others. There's nothing wrong with having a strong core group of people. Totally. Anyways, keep going. Let's keep maybe, going. Maybe, maybe even a good example of what you just said would be open source software, right? I mean, Google. Oh, could have... <laughs> right? I mean, Google. Are you back to technology. Is that what you're doing there, Tan Mang? <laughs> yes, I am. You know, you know all the all these analogies I come up with. They're they're tech related in some way. <laughs> Do we have another live question. Yes, we do. Um, let's see. Actually, there's two that are very similar to each other, so I'm going to take them both up at once. Uh, uh -oh. These are from <laughs> Akash and Koyukon MC. Uh, Akash! <laughs> what, what, is, what? Come on. Go, go with OUC first, because Akash... Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> so, although they're basically the same thing. So, uh, Koyukon's saying, how can you make a computer science degree, or how can you bring a computer science degree to its full potential um, while not being a code mule, um, as well as uh, the second part of this question from Akash, um, talking about passion, what are your views on lots of students only taking computer science so they can get a job at like one of the big five companies? All right, well, Akash, uh, okay, so I don't know if I can answer the code mule. I don't know what a, I, I, I'm assuming a code Just mule someone is someone that's that code all day, that's it. Yeah, okay, okay. So, here's the thing. If your goal is just to get a job and, you know, be the bare minimum developer, fine. I, I know I, I work at a company. It's a lot of engineers, Microsoft. And I know a lot of these people just go do computer science classes. They go up there and they just get an entry level job or whatever. But I'll be very frank, man. A lot of them lack empathy. A lot of them lack the soft skills to grow in their career. And it's disgusting. It really breaks my heart. Like I see them talk towards each other. And I'm like, you do realize this is a human being on the other side here. And the toxicity towards the engineering community in these companies sometimes is really sad. Mm -hmm. I don't see as much of that from like, or have to interact with that as much anymore because I'm sales. I am a customer facing person. And it's so different though. In my field, when you are working with a customer, you can't be petty. <laughs> you, you don't get the right to be petty or the opportunity because the minute you get exposed as that, <laughs> you know, because if you have to be empathetic, you have to try to understand who your customer is. You have to try to sell to them appropriately, bring to the table relevant information, not just my point of view. Um, and I think, so here's where I'm at here. If you want to stand out as a software engineer, as a computer scientist, show how you're working in the community. Show how you are being a leader. And I don't mean necessarily the head of like the hackers group or the head, because that, that's only again forces you to stay in your bubble. You need to go outside your bubble. You know, I was an undergrad, I was, um, I, I was a part of a Christian organization that was Korean. So I like, and I'm Korean. I, um, but again, they're human beings. Why not? I was part of the school of business, uh, leadership community for information systems, operations management. I then did stuff mentoring in, in college. I would also mentor again, younger generations through the Lego league through junior achievement. You know, there are so many things available to you to help out the community that doesn't just rely on that. And I look back at Steve Jobs and Steve Jobs even said, you know, he's like, we do not want people that are just CS degrees. We liberal arts degrees are important to him. And he said that because they're more in touch with reality. Like you said, it is very easy to be so hyper focused on the technology you're building that you forget that there are human beings you're building for. Mm -hmm. And I think the more you can be human centered in your design, your experience on your resume, on your portfolio, the activities that you're doing, that makes you stand out. That'll make your code better. Mm -hmm. That'll make your, how you write your instructions better. I think your comments better in uh, code reviews and whatnot and, and your performance reviews with people as you become a manager. I think that'll help. I, I, you know, like this is an area that's a little more outside my comfort zone, so I don't want it to be taken necessarily as um, the Bible, mm -hmm. and, you know, or for fact or for whatever reason. Or as, but my point is, this is my observation. This is James is our cherry's observation there, and how I think a CS person could be a better CS person. Yeah, I mean, I, first of all, I feel like that that's definitely very valuable because 
what you said is is really not necessarily specific to technology, although it is tailored for that. It's even just more general, right? Don't don't stay within that bubble of yours, right? There's so much experience that you can gain from other completely different industries that you can then apply to technology that it's it's almost weird just how much you can transfer between fields. Right? I feel like we don't give ourselves as humans enough credit. We are really really good at transfer learning, which is something that machine learning is terrible at. <laughs> so I'm tying it back into tech. All right, so last question that I want to ask you really quickly. Uh, this is a question from Hrishka, uh, uh, Hrishika on the uh, live stream chat. Uh, she's asking, how can you go about learning when people are discouraging you instead of encouraging you? Well, great question. And unfortunately, there will always be people discouraging you regardless of where you go in life. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean they're just going to be like, ah, oh, you're dumb or something like that. No, they will they will push in work. Perfect example. I'm in sales and supposedly we're all on the same team to try to sell to the customer, to win and help them out. And you will have people be like, I don't think that idea is going to work. I've tried it before. It's, and this is not make, this is not making fun of a woman. Uh, this is me just making fun of a person that's annoying. Yeah. Just, and they'll be like, it's not going to work. It's frustrating. Uh, no, I tried this before. We shouldn't do it. I'm like, just because you've tried something before doesn't mean it was done the right way. Yeah. And I, you know what? You earn the right to show and prove. Prove it. You know, let your actions speak for themselves. Don't let people's opinions dictate your view on what you think might be right. Like, go and prove them wrong. Mm -hmm. you no. Know, um, and I'll tell you right now, there will probably be more supporters for you than detractors. You just have to find that circle of supporters. Um, and and it, it just happens, unfortunately, because we are, we are all humans and we are flawed. And even the best intention people will give negative advice at times. Mm -hmm. You know, Walt Disney, perfect example. He was going to build Disneyland. His wife was like, theme parks are dirty. Amusement parks are dirty. Why are you gonna make one? He's like, mine's not gonna be. <laughs> you know, but, but exactly, but, but here's the thing. She loved him. And she and he loves her, but she had a biased understanding of the vision. Yeah. Right. And Walt could have been like, "Oh, you're right. People aren't going to want." No. Walt knew what he wanted. Mm -hmm. He knew what the experience was going to be. His vision of what the experience is going to be. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't mean he cut her out of her life. No. He just he showed her. He led by an example. This goes back to the self-taught. No, we mean self-start. Mm -hmm. Self-start. Be curious. Reflective. Go. Be active about it. Mm -hmm. But you are very great and right and this is why community is so important and tan may has a community of supporters for people out there like you stay in touch with tan may in this group ask them for guidance and support you need that and but the best part is also with the globalization of the world and the internet you've got more supporters than detractors probably nice. uh, now i mean granted though it's very easy for people to be trolls <laughs> don't mind them it's it's probably easier said than done but um, ma'am, I just tell you right now, you, I never met you before, but I also support your goals and your vision here too. Um, and thank you for asking that question. So, you know, look, you've got a champion in me, James on charity. Um, I'll root for you. I'm, 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 I'm just proud that you're here and I hope that you go and crush it. I mean, I'm sure that definitely is going to help her out a lot. So again, any more questions, feel free to put them in the chat and, uh, you know, dust we're... off the hate girl. Dust <laughs> Hey. <laughs> yep, Sorry, man, man. Say, man. No, it's good. It's good. I, I, I like it. This is going to go in a, a best of Tanma Each is real. Oh, sorry, Tanma Tech Life Skills real. <laughs> <laughs> but but yeah, I, I totally agree with you. You know, um, any any sort of questions or you know, whenever you do need this sort of support, you've got all the different resources online. There are always going to be people that you can find that would love to help. You know, if it's related to tech or even anything around it, you know, there's definitely my channel. And you know, feel free to feel free to reach out and yeah. I, I hate plugging this early, but I heard I heard Tanme was creating a thing called Tanme Bakshi's Army, and it's and it's a <laughs> it's a community where you can be, you know, subscribe into for support, you know, I think that's the key clutch there. You've got to support there. Tammy, you should tell them, tell them later about the financial implications, you know, like a dollar a month or a dollar a year to be a part of it. But no, the that. point is, though, Tammy is bringing together a great group of people like yourself that are interested in growing. And, you know, there's power in that. 
Precisely. Thank you very much, James. And uh, I, I know that I said a minute ago that, um, uh, that, that this would be the last question, but there is one more that I want to take up. Uh, this one's from Vijay. Uh, he's asking, I'm in final year IIT Delhi, and I want to pursue research in quantum computing, but how good will that pay me back in the future? So I don't know. <laughs> I'm not a quantum guy. I know. So I, I'm going to I'm going to do a quick note on this one, actually, because I feel like this is a really interesting question. That is that um, the thing about research or, or, or even fields in general, like quantum computing, is that they're definitely in their infancy. But let me tell you something. A lot of people would view this as, you know, where am I going to get a job? But I would view it as you have the opportunity to make an impact in a field that's currently still growing and is still being you know solidified nowadays with modern computing things are very rigid because there's just so much built on top of it that it's really yeah. hard to go back to the bottom and, and and just think you know what's what's actually happening at the, at the, at the very fundamental base so it's hard to do that um and so oh actually now that i'm looking at the live stream oh, chat me. yes i want to add to that i want to add to that you brought up a great point. I think back when blockchain was just getting started yeah. and a lot of people were like, meh, it's not going anywhere. But the people that spent some time and energy, even if they only had six months of understanding of it, they got invited to go speak at conferences. <laughs> they, got to go to invite, they go to be like the top blockchain leads at startups or whatever and where at. And so my point there is I'm not saying that's going to happen to you. But the point is when you get in at the early stages on anything, you then, the best part is then your age doesn't even matter yeah. because it's about the years of experience there. You're not dealing with SAP integrations that have been around for 30 plus years <laughs> or, you know what I mean? Yeah. You are at the early stages of understanding this technology and people will start to view you as a thought leader and then your age no longer becomes an issue. Precisely. I, I totally agree. Also, just a quick correction. I just looked at uh, the thing. I, I, I misread the live stream chat. This is not from Vijay. This is from Shivam. So thank you for this question, Shivam. Um, but also, yeah, I mean, that's exactly what I mean, right? Like today, if you were to go to, uh, I don't know, uh, Microsoft and you were like, uh, you know, oh, there's these many, you know, improvements we can make to the Windows NT kernel powering Windows 10 um, because, you know, we've learned so much from, from Linux and Unix and these other operating systems. You can't really do that because there's just so much built on top of Windows that the cost of switching even for that bit of advantage that would then pay off in the future, just that initial cost is too great to um, to justify that that large switch. But again, within a, within a field like quantum computing, you have that opportunity to say, you know, we're still pouring down the concrete, right? So we we're still uh, we're still building those foundations. And it's, it's not as much in its infancy as you might think, right? I used to think it was way more in its infancy than I do today, right? We, we see IBM promising they're going to have like a thousand uh, Quibit uh, quantum computers in a couple of years. Microsoft's doing some fun work. Google, Amazon, pretty much everyone's doing some fun work with quantum. Um, and so, you know, it's possible we're going to get some genuinely useful ones soon too. So very, uh... <laughs> <laughs> very very exciting field i will say so uh good good luck on your uh on your uh, journey working with that tech and so this was an exciting discussion but one more thing uh oh <laughs> this is the fun part all right um so what i'm gonna say here so the, the tech life skills audience is incredibly diverse right we've got all sorts of folks we've got developers we've got um uh, we, we've got uh, people from business, people from uh, people who are students. As a matter of fact, Saisley actually right now is asking on the live stream chat, speaking of students, can you give me some motivational words to encourage especially uh, those at a young age to study programming? <laughs> um, not me, that would be you, but because uh, you were the one that started at a young age to learn programming. I'm not going to say programming. I'm going to say encouraging words. And if you decide to go be a programmer, awesome. Look, at the end of the day, um, there's a lot of things out there. And the only way to understand what works for you and what doesn't work for you is to go explore and read and experience and try. Be a trier. Be a doer. Be ever curious because the world will fill you with so much joy if you truly are always ever curious. There will be moments where you will get the haters, the detractors, the blockers, 
it happens, but you're not alone. You are never alone in that. And there are more people that will want the best for you than the worst for you. That is a end of story. No debate there. I promise you that. Never met you, whoever you are. But again, support, cherish you. I mean, maybe not financially because I'm not your uncle, <laughs> but I, I will always be there to provide a happy little word or a phrase or whatnot. And Tame needs the James cheerful minute of the day. <laughs> We'll start recording those. Okay, yeah. mate. Seriously, we should start doing little we, minute. We got to do that. We yes. got to make the the James cheerful minute a day app, right? You you spot up your phone in the morning. <laughs> you know <laughs> what? You see? Let's do it. We're, you, we joke, but you know, and I, we're actors, we're doers. We need something like this. Okay. That's a good point. A good know, the... morning clip for people to see. <laughs> oh my God! It's, we'll do the James and Tammy TikToks. Um, <laughs> but. But why, but I'll, I'll entertain your question for a second. Why programming? Okay, look, I'm not a programmer. It's not for me because of my, my attention span. <laughs> I tried it. IBM gave me all these opportunities to learn. And yeah, part of me wishes I had done it, but I would never be a developer in my life. I, I just can't, I am such a people person. My personality lends itself too much to be a presenter, to be a uh, problem. So I am a problem solver though. And I am creative, like I do design thinking, I do whiteboarding, I do storyboarding, I do all that. I break the biggest, most complex generic idea where they're like, IBM or Microsoft and Starbucks. Go figure that out, James. Go figure out what a strategic partnership looks like. And I'm like, what? What, what the heck are you giving me here? All I know is two different companies come up with an idea, but then that led to a $130 million deal. Mm -hmm. Wow. So over three years, right? But uh, you know that took me nine months to work on, but it was fun. It was awesome. Um, so hey, look, I think at the end of the day, we you just have to be willing to try new things, figure out why some things are not interesting to you, and then move on. That that not everyone should be a programmer. Everyone says we need to make everyone. I don't know. Not we need everyone to be the same. Not at all. <laughs> Does that's, everyone need a certain level of expo exposure? Yes, that's my goes back to my point. Expose them to these things for them for them to find out if they like it or not. Mm -hmm. You know, we're all worried about the day and age of autonomization of jobs and whatnot. Um, that that is definitely certain industries are getting autonomized. But I think though, the soft skills, the understanding of problems and people, that will always be there. So, I completely agree there i mean I, 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 how would you answer that question first of all i feel like i completely agree with your advice but you know just the sort of um i mean the first no, thing i have to do that every time because i'm your mentor your big brother. <laughs> it's not just because of that it's because you actually do give genuinely good advice <laughs> as a matter of fact it's not just me even a live stream says it and that hey, hey, you just... heard that tammy says i give good advice <laughs> sorry <laughs> Go ahead. Well, it's not just me. Even Namit on the live stream just said you're a great life skills teacher, James. So you know you're not you're not just hearing it from me. <laughs> oh, damn it! Don't forget to plug in my websites. Yes, totally. We will be doing that in just a moment. Really quickly though, uh, for say sleep, and I was actually about to start off by saying that you know you should be doing what it is that you're passionate about, James. I think you covered that angle perfectly, right? And that is. Not everyone needs to be a programmer. That's pretty much the exact opposite of what we're talking about, right? What we're saying is that everybody needs to be doing what they're passionate about. And the only way to figure that out is if you're exposed to a little bit of everything, right? Yeah, exposed and, to programming. There's nothing wrong. Schools should teach it. Yes. They should teach it in a way, though, not just teach it and check a box, yes. but yes. teach it where you learn, you, you scratch. Like, Precisely. I think the biggest turnoff for me with programming when I first learned was it was these black and white textbooks, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, because I was born in 89 and they didn't have scratch like you had. Um, I thought it was really cool. If I hadn't been exposed to robotics, like kids were, you know, 10 years ago, eight years ago with the Lego, uh, you know, robotic little tool that you like you scratch almost to. God, I would have been building those sets all the time. Cause I built models, I built Lego kits. You know, I built these like Gundam models. I would have done that so much of my free time, but it is what it is. And I don't regret the life that I live today. And so I think though it has to be though at that age in a fun, 
way where again they see they're solving a problem they're yeah. not just coding for the sake of coding it's the same thing with me like people may not realize this but i do ultra endurance events right i've done 70 hour endurance events where i haven't slept i've built gone to mongolia i've gone to iceland i will put my body through that because there's a goal there's an outcome designed around it. it's the team building it's leading groups of people it's building a yurt in the middle of the night it's swimming across this lake in freezing water or whatever it is but there's a reason behind it there's a reward system there's the medals it's the self and you so you the self discovery of how tough you are but if someone tells me to go run for 24 hours non-stop and there's no reason behind it i'm not going to do that <laughs> You know what I mean? Some yeah. people sure, they're masochists and they'll do that, but that's not the majority of the United the world. And I think, especially for children, they are outcomes based. They like, wh wh why? Why am I doing this? Yeah. It should be fun. Back to John Cohn's point: exposure to programming at a young age should be fun. It should be like when you our first video of Tame La Tame made Watson made simple with Tame Bakshi. You showed people how to control a drone via a chat feature. Yes. Right? It wasn't just, hey, we're going to build a chat and talk to people. No, I'm going to show you the power of chat and how it can control and fly a drone or order a pizza. Mm -hmm. Like, that was fun. Like, it was a creative way. That's the whole point. Yeah. Keep going. Sorry. No, no, not at all. I mean, I feel like that's, again, I mean, it feels like I'm just saying this over and over again. But again, your advice really just is that good. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, that, that first of all, that's a great extension to what I just mentioned about you know doing something that it is that you're pa that that you're passionate about and starting off fun, right? Sort of my my three um, main tips actually have always been start small, start easy, start playful, right? Yeah, that's 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 really it. And and I mean this this extends everywhere. Like I was at, um, uh, I mean first of all, actually you mentioned um, being able to do things with a specific outcome in mind. Like I mean with your endurance events. I mean, I don't necessarily have the physical capability for that. I mean, I'll go to Iceland yes. really only for a keynote. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a sport in and of itself. Yes, yes, it is. But uh, that's, uh, it's, 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 it's fascinating what you do. I'll say that much. Um, so, so that's, that's one thing. But I mean, this, this really extends everywhere. Like there was um, an event that I was at um, in, in London for the Apple Distinguished Schools there. Um, and there was a bunch of teachers and, and school leaders from like Apple Distinguished Schools in, in the UK. Um, and you know, my, my main message in the keynote, well, actually at the end, wasn't even just about technology, it was just generally, right? As school leaders, their responsibility is to introduce kids to everything, right? In a yeah. way that enables them to find out what it is that they're passionate about and mm. to expose them enough to different fields where they can start to transfer their learning across and that's what the responsibility of a school is and if technology is this new subject that we've got to start incorporating into that then so be it right that's that's what i'm going to sort of help them do but you know that that at, at the end of the day we don't want the school or, or the organization or the institution generally to, to 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 lose that end goal right and we don't want them to lose sight of that goal so Again, to Sacely, uh, thank you for asking that question. Hopefully, we were able to, to answer that for you. Uh, and hopefully, uh, that was helpful as well. Uh, as a matter of fact, <laughs> um, I am going to take up one last question. And this one's from oh, Shiva. Oh, no. Came in, uh, came in just now, so, so Shiva's asking. What points do you keep in mind as a developer when you're satisfying different expectations of users? This goes back to our empathy point, I think, a little bit. Back what you were saying about like the ten stars, seven stars, like the whole way that um, some organizations deal with uh, deal with actually, tell, you know, figuring out what features to put in their products. And actually, one thing that I will say before uh, before I hand this off to you, James, I feel like one of my favorite uh, demonstrations of where the value of technology comes in is the phones that we use every day, right? Mm. If you think about it, the phones, they have a very specific purpose, and that is to mm. augment our capabilities of what we just do you know, on the fly with really, really powerful technology. And you'd think that just throwing a lot more compute power in here would make your life better, right? You would no. think, well, I mean, yes. But but, uh, yeah, you're right, you're right. You would think <laughs> hypothetically. Yeah. yeah, you would think that hypothetically just throwing 12 gigabytes of RAM into an iPhone would, would make your life better because it would be faster, you could do more give things it a, at once. Give <laughs> it also a 30 megapixel camera. 
<laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll plot four cameras on the back. Uh, we'll make our lives better. But what a lot of people don't realize is that's not necessarily the case. If that ends up making it so you have to, you know, create some sort of trade-off in, in price or the battery life of the phone or, or the, the heat that it generates in your pocket or the size of it in your hand, all these things need to be taken into account. It's not just about raw numbers when it comes to technology. So as a developer, you shouldn't be looking into, and that's why like iPhones still only have four gigs of RAM, whereas you can get pretty much any other phone with like 16, right? <laughs> and that's because it's about the value that it adds, not the raw technical specs. So as a yeah. developer, you need to be thinking, when I implement this feature, is this going to help my users? Could I be spending this time somewhere else? Could I be making another feature that's gonna help more of my users so that they can live a better life? So I would say, that by empathizing with the user, right, and going back to what James said, um, that is how you can actually keep those points in mind. But James, what do you think? Well, I think, again, it comes back to yourself. You can be a user. Ask yourself, whatever you're making, what are the things that it's supposed to do? What are the things that you can measure that it's supposed to do? Mm -hmm. And then, what is it, what's the wow? Like, what are the wows that it has? Like, what is the, the impact? And then you, you ask the validating questions you go about, and then you can figure out how you go about doing it. Because a lot of times I will get, I work with a lot of different product teams at Microsoft and they try to present me because they want me to then present to their customer, right? They need me to get to these customers or me to speak on their behalf to the account team to get to these customers. And they're like, well, let me walk you through my product. And I'm like, do not start with me on the history of Microsoft on AI. Do not, because they love to do that for some reason. Do not start, because they feel like they have to like cram stuff. Like to your point, like all this information, it's answer. I don't need it. Do not tell me, please, like what is the history of AI at Microsoft or um, go right into the what does the product do. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't need to know how it does what it, what it does. What I first need to know is, what is the wow that it is addressing? What is, what is the call to action for the customer here that is going to help? And if you have not clearly thought out what you are solving for, then you don't know what you're building. Mm -hmm. You cannot build something if you don't know what it's going to do, right? Mm -hmm. Think through it. And again, you don't have to develop code first for that. Write this down on pieces of paper, mm -hmm. run through that first. Cause guess what? Less time and energy less frustration because imagine you build this whole product spend 50 hours on develop work and whatnot and then the customer's like nope that's not what i want at all and you're like <laughs> head against keyboard and tame you know that's a thing totally and so um i would i would encourage you first figure out what is that wow that you want to address take some time figure it out it don't I don't know how old you are or whatever, but there's plenty of time. The guy who, you know, did Coca-Cola was 55. <laughs> you know, um, you you've got it. You you can do this. You can take the time to properly spend on what is the wow. Mm -hmm. Then you can address the how you're going to do the wow. Totally. And uh, that's how you do it. Because here's the thing: development doesn't have to be developing code. Developing mm -hmm. could be, um, you know, a classroom. A class experience. What is the wow that I'm going to offer my students, right? Mm -hmm. How? Then you will then figure out the how to get there, right? If, if my goal is to delight my students every time they come into the class, I will then spend time thinking, how am I going to do that? Okay. Versus just teaching. My, if, if my goal is to just teach them history, but the experience is horrible, no. Mm -hmm. And that's another thing. Always ask them what is the best positive experience that they can have. How can I create a delightful experience right here? Because again, it's about the experience. Humans experience things. Mm -hmm. Machines don't necessarily. They just they take the code, they put the code, they're done with it, right? Mm -hmm. Human though, you give me a, you you give me a message, I'm gonna be like, oh, that could have been mean. That was a little connotated. That was a little condescending. A computer's not gonna give a crap if it's I'm sending or not, <laughs> right? <laughs> a computer's not gonna reply back saying, Tame, the way you wrote that code was really. <laughs> <laughs> or your feedback there. I don't like I don't like that. You know, imagine if your computer spoke back to you like that. Uh, yeah, that would be uh 
Uh, I can I, I know personally a lot of developers that would not have a really good time after that. Uh, <laughs> but regardless, though, I mean, first of all, thank you, Shiva, for asking this question, and, and I feel like hopefully we, we've been able to answer your question. We did talk a little bit, again, more about this empathy stuff towards the um, beginning of the live stream in the middle, so feel free to take a look at that as well. Uh, also, I just saw uh, in the live stream chat that Saisley said it's her birthday today, so happy birthday. Uh, hopefully you have a, a great day today. Um, and, I mean, as a matter of fact, I know you asked a question about, you know, what, uh, what, what sort of motivational words do we have for people getting into the world of technology, you know, young students and stuff. Uh, so hopefully I'm able to help you out. I mean, uh, I know that uh, I'm going to be sort of uh, mentoring you similar to, and, and hopefully I'm able to follow uh, in, in sort of James' footsteps oh, with you. So, <laughs> so, so happy birthday. Thank um, you. <laughs> oh, it's not my birthday? Oh, no, man. It's, it's Saisley's birthday. <laughs> Isn't it your birthday coming no, up? It's Saisley's birthday today, okay, uh, the yours? one that asked the question. But mine is in a couple of days, yes, on, on Friday. Woo! Yeah. <laughs> We're going to have a fun. special podcast episode. <laughs> streamers everywhere the tanfe birthday special uh, <laughs> that would be fun <laughs> but um yeah so so hopefully i'm able to uh, sort of mentor you similar in a similar way Saisley. as a matter of fact actually since we're on the topic really quickly getting back to your question for just a minute Saisley, um i will say that the way that coding is taught in schools today uh, the way that they try at least isn't really what I would say particularly effective. I mean, everybody does it differently. It's not very standardized right now, but I wouldn't say that the average implementation of this in a school anywhere in the world is particularly great, right? There's definitely better ways to do it. Um, I've seen schools where the computer science teachers uh, don't know much about computer science themselves, and that just completely turns off the students to the world of computer science, I, I'll say that. Um, as a matter of fact, before I was even born, um, <laughs> this uh, the wonderful coder, I mean, I'm sure you've heard of him. I'm probably butchering the pronunciation of his name, but Joel Spolsky um, from, from New York, one of the co-founders of Stack Overflow, wrote this article called Back to Basics, and I've already put the link to that in uh, the live stream chat. It's from 2001. This is two years before I existed. Um, but um, he, he sort of foresaw this entire, what he calls a pedagogical disaster, um, and he's, uh, he's talking about that in this blog, and I think that's more relevant today than it ever has been, actually. So feel free to take a look at that. Um, <clears throat> and so, yeah, I, feel, I believe those were actually all of the questions now. So, I mean, we've, we've talked about quite a bit of uh, stuff, but honestly, I love that discussion. Uh, and, and getting back to what I was saying just before we got to more questions, um, you know, the Tech Life Skills audience is really diverse. And so we, we talk about all sorts of topics. And so, James, if I had to ask you, if there's one closing message you want to share with our audience today before we leave, what would that message be for everybody? Um, always be curious, stay hungry, stay curious, uh, and don't be free, don't, seriously, don't be afraid to ask, like, too many people are afraid to ask these days, they don't think they're ready, just because whatever your age is, just because of whatever your level is, does not limit your influence in the world at all, or the influence around you, you can always make a positive impact and you can always learn. So that would be my, 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 uh, my sentiment. That is something that I live by religiously. So wonderful. Thank, Thank you, you for having me. So, uh, make sure to check me out. James Archery on LinkedIn, uh, Facebook, James Michael Archery link, uh, but for the more like life lessons, check out my website, uh, James archery.com. And most importantly, my Instagram at jungle James one. So, um, cause I'm the first jungle James one, uh, on Instagram. I really encourage you to follow. It's uh, laughter all around, uh, very, very, you know, healthy, healthy, healthy content for you to escape a little bit. If you want, it's just humor. It's just real life, fun stuff. So very nice. And, uh, I, I've seen, you know, on, on your Instagram that that common theme of all the uh, all the well the events that you used to be able to do those you know endurance events and stuff. So uh, if and, you want to check that out, there. photos from where I hike because I'm always yes. hiking in Washington, Seattle. 
Seattle, very Washington. Nice. Very nice. So yeah, do check him out at Jungle James One on Instagram too. You got to get that trademarked. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> yeah. So Jamie, is that it? Is that everything? I believe so. I mean, we've covered a lot. I will be putting uh, James contact, all this info, his website down in the description below. So feel free to check him out if you'd like. So once again, thank you very much, James, for joining us today. I mean, first of all, this was a really fun episode. Thank you very much to everyone in the audience as well, also for joining us. Uh, hopefully, we were able to help. If there are any questions we didn't get to, feel free to put them in the comments. James and I will go ahead and get back to you soon as well. Uh, so thank you very much, everybody. Uh, of course, the Tech Life Skills series is held every Sunday in the morning at 11, at 11 a.m. Eastern time. So make sure you join us next week. We're going to be talking about, not going to give you too much of info, but the next generation of networking from a technical perspective not from a human perspective. So this time we talked about networking from this, uh, you know, person aspect. But next time we're going to be talking about like technology. Routers and 5G. You 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 hit the nail on the head with 5G. So. Uh, oh. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, are you guys going to just prove that it doesn't cause you know things to set on fire? <laughs> it's it's sad that that's something we need to disprove. <laughs> But what? it's sad that that's something we need to disprove. I know. <laughs> hey, maybe careful. People are listening. They may be on. All right. We'll. Uh, anyway. All right. All right. All right. We talk Keep about five G. Take care. Of course. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, James. And goodbye. Later, little brother. Bye.